Well, we are in this series, and we're in the final week, and I just want to let you know that there's so much to cover, but I do want to go back for just a moment. In week one, we talked about tithing, that we return to God the first tenth, and then that first tenth has the ability to bless everything else. And so we, we give to God the first tenth, we bring it to the local storehouse, and then it fuels his mission, the church, to reach the world with the message of Jesus Christ. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody that's stepping out in faith and you're going ahead and you're tithing for the first time. I know the, the, just the anticipation, the faith that rises up, and as soon as you do it, the enemy tries to snatch it away from you and say, now you're never gonna make it, you're never gonna make it. You're ne- you gotta overcome the voice of the enemy and step out and believe in faith. So thank you for everybody that's doing that and stepping out and doing that. Now, week two, we talked about blessed to be a blessing. We talked about over and above. And I wanna say thank you to that panel. How many know there were so many different God moments in that? I just was there and uh, just taking it all in and I was realizing that there were people that were making sacrificial giving, of course, that people giving percentage and gold giving, and then others saying, here am I, send me. Uh, of course, Sam Johnson saying, uh, I'm gonna go tell him 100. I love that guy. And just to see what God could do and thank you for the panel for doing that. If you have not seen that video, Please, please, please watch last week's. The panel was worth it. And then be praying about your part in the $7.5 million goal that we have for Kingdom Builders over and above. We talked about over and above the tithe. We wanna be blessed to be a blessing and give over and above. And we're believing God for $7.5 million. And uh, we should be praying this. The psalmist said this in Psalm 116, verse 12. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? That's what I think all the time. I cannot tell you how many times Beck and I have been on a walk. We love to walk. Uh, Starbucks, like we said, is two miles from our house. We go two miles, get caffeinated, come back, you know, do that. And it kind of encourages me on the way. I'm like a reward person. I need reward. I need a halfway reward and a home reward. All right. But I, we, we say, like, how can we say thank you to God for all that he's done? He's blessed us with so much. How can we say thank you? And how much more can we give? That's how we live. Now today, uh, I always love giving a practical insight, practical help from the Word of God, and uh, today I'm entitling this sermon, uh, Be Wise and Beware. Be Wise and Beware, because there's so much in the Bible on this topic of money and stewardship. There's 215 verses that pertain to faith, there's 218 verses that pertain to salvation, and there's 2,058 verses dealing with stewardship and accountability with money. 2058, so it's an important thing. Now, way too many Christians are living under the domination of money. Money is over them, money's not a tool. They don't have it in order. One pastor estimated that he thinks 80% of the people in the body of Christ are being dominated by money and the spirit of mammon rather than living how God wants them to live and have it as a tool in their hands, and I, I would agree with that. With so much to cover, I just wanna remind you again that we have a, a paid resource for you, Ramsey Plus. We talked about this with Financial Peace University. It's normally $130, and the church has paid for this. It costs thousands of dollars to do this, but we paid for every single person to be able to go through this and be able to be a part of it. Almost 1,000 people have already signed up, and you'll have it free for one year. There's no catch in this. You have one year of paid content to go through it, and to, uh, to sign up for this. So we just want you to sign up this weekend and be able to sign up. You can text the word Ramsey to 94,000. And again, I did it. Others have done it, almost 1,000. There are going to be life groups. Some of you are like, I can't do it on my own. I need to have some encouragement. I need to have other people along. So we have life groups. You can go to our life group locator and you can find financial peace uh, life groups that you can be a part of and you'll have that encouragement. Um, just a side note, I know that for in my own life, when I was trying to lose weight years ago, having somebody holding me accountable helped me show up. Knowing that there'd be a trainer there waiting for me and that was gonna, and it was gonna call me if I wasn't there, that helped me go to the health club. Having that accountability in your life could help you. So sign up and you're gonna learn things about credit cards, debt snowball, budgets, insurance, car buying, emergency fund, retirement, wills, okay, all that. So sign up and get that. It's all been paid for. Those that have tithed have paid for this and it's available. We don't get anything for this, all right? We're not getting any cut of all the people that go to Ramsey Plus, all right? We just paid for it and we wanna give you the tools to move forward. Now today, 
uh, be wise and beware. You gotta be wise. I believe you need to be wiser than ever when it comes to dealing with money, and I'll show you uh, what I mean by this. Historians have said that uh, money was invented in 600 BC by King Elites of Lydia, which is now part of Turkey, all right? So it's been around. Money has been around for a long time. 600 BC is when people started exchanging money rather than just goods. But the concept of retirement is only two generations old. A lot of you are saving for retirement, planning for retirement, maybe even living in retirement, but that concept is only two generations old. And yet, in 2018, there was $27 trillion in retirement accounts. The 401k did not exist until 1978. It's something we talk about, oh, how much you got your 401k, you got your 401k. Did not even exist until 1978. The Roth IRA, 1998. And so everybody's like, well, you got your Roth and you got your IRA, okay. These are new things. Venture capitalists, that really didn't take off until about 25 years ago. So these are terms and things that we talk about all the time. There are so many moving parts and all these things make it more complex. You need to be wise with money and the wisdom that God's word gives you will help you to handle things in the world we're living in. According to Morgan Housel, the author of The Psychology of Money, he says even more crazy than that, the most powerful thing today is media and the power of stories. The power of stories are now the most uh, powerful thing in the economy and I can illustrate it to you with the year that we just went through. The power of story caused us to all panic and think that we were going to run out of toilet paper. I was in Singapore when America was locking down. I was coming back from Singapore, and the first time in my life, I actually took the toilet paper from the hotel and put it in my suitcase, because I didn't know if I'd have any toilet paper when I got back. Power of story. Then it was meat, you're gonna run out of meat, you better go buy meat. If you don't buy meat now, you're gonna run out of meat. You're coveting your friend's chickens that it lives on the farm. You're like, if only we had chickens in our yard, you know? Then it was two million people will die for sure. It was like we're, millions are gonna die. And then the stock market, what did it do? The power of story, boom, and it crashes. The power, it's so complex. And so we need the wisdom and we need to be wise and we need to look into God's word and see that there's wisdom available for us as we handle our finances. Proverbs 27, or 22 verse seven says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. It's just one of many verses that deal with debt, collateral, interest. And I wanna let you know that it's not a sin to be in debt, but the Bible is very clear that it will cost you something. It's something that we should use as a tool. It shouldn't be a plan. It should be a tool that we use. And the key thing about debt in the Bible is having things for collateral. That's why even people like Dave Ramsey will say, it's okay to buy a house because you collateralize. That is put up against the loan. And if you don't make the payment, they take the house. So there's something that's collateral. But you gotta be careful with that. I bought my home, Beck and I bought our home right in 2008. And we watched the price of our home go down, down, down. Our retirement plan became a liability. And now it's come back and I can finally see above water again. But see, so you, you just gotta realize there, that there's something about when you are the borrower that you are slave to the lender. They have the ability to demand terms. They have the ability to step in. And the use of debt in our life will foster a debt mentality. That's what Randy Alcorn says in his wonderful book, Money, Possessions, and Eternity. We have credit cards, we have high interest, we have all these things, and we have this debt mentality that we live in. And the Bible says, remember, if you, if you are the borrower, you're slave to the lender. There's something going on. But we have this mentality that it's okay. And so we say that we need more than God has given to us, that God doesn't know what's best, so we'll just put it on the credit card. I'll never forget when I told the kids, I said, we can't afford that. They're like, yeah, you can. You got that plastic thing. We learn quick. How many know what I'm talking about? We start to say, God has failed to provide for my needs, and I'll find another way. I'll find another way to take care of this. We start presuming that my future is predictable and it won't change. 
We say our circumstances won't change. That's what debt mentality says. My health will be fine. My job will be fine. Um, inflation will be fine. God's call on my life won't happen, right? These are things we presume upon in the debt mentality. And we've gotta follow God's wisdom and eliminate debt, eliminate this interest. And I wanna let you know that Becca and I, years ago, just determined we were not going to have credit card interest. We started this church on our credit cards, five Visa gold cards, $100,000. River Valley Church, I, I hate to say this, this is why I'm so, like, I, don't, I, I want you to not pay interest because I, I paid plenty, all right? You know? So River Valley did enough, all right? So we determined we're never gonna do that again. We paid off all the credit cards. The church finally did that, hasn't had that credit card debt. We personally had credit card debt. We said, we're never gonna do this again. And so we said, we're gonna, we're gonna live not being slave to the lender. We have one car payment that we're making. It's at 1.9%. And we had the money to pay it off, but I was actually earning more on it than the 1.9. So I actually left the money there and I'm making the payment. But I could take the money out of savings and pay the truck off. I could do that. Our house debt is our only debt that we have. And even with that, if we had to, we could cash in retirement and pay off the house. We're trying to live not being slave to the lender. You gotta be wise, you gotta avoid debt. That's something the Bible shows us. But there's another thing the Bible shows us, to be wise and to save. And, and so many financial planners talk about saving here on earth. I just wanna let you know that the Bible tells us the smart people save money in heaven. It really does. It tells us that in Matthew 6, 19, it says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. On earth, it can be lost, it can be stolen, and you will leave it behind. How many know you can't take it with you? You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. And so you can invest. You can say, God, I can turn something here into eternal rewards. I can do this. And I know for uh, Midwest people especially, I know our church is based in Minnesota. We go all around the world now. And I'm believing God that we're gonna have campuses and, and outreach all around the world. And I thank God for everybody tuning in. But there's just a, a, a Minnesota thing that's just like, you know, uh, you know like I, I can't, if I lay up treasure in heaven, doesn't that feel like wrong? Like, I just gotta do it because I'm a nice guy, right? I just, I just give to God because I don't, you know? But God says, know what? When you do this for me and you do this, you're actually laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. And then he says, you know what the return is? 100 times. That's a good interest rate. He says 100 times. So first thing is, as we save, remember you can save in heaven. But while we're here on earth, the Bible tells us to be wise and to save. Proverbs 6, verse 6 through 8 says, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider it ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. So we save, and we teach this with Ramsey Plus, with Financial Peace University, to at least have a $1,000 emergency fund so that you can go ahead, when there is that emergency, you don't have to put it on the credit card and then fall further further behind. Then we say get three to six months of savings, of, of, of expenses, of your household expenses. Put that in savings and have that there. Now, Becca and I are living that out. And so we have that. We have the six months uh, income in savings. We're living what we preach and what we teach. And here's the interesting thing. So when the stock market crashed this last year and went down, I was like, note to self, everything's on sale. And so we took this money that was there, just sitting in a lower interest bearing account, and immediately I went and said, I'm buying stocks, and went over there because we are saving and being good stewards and living out this principle. And I'm just illustrating this for you, and we were able to take this money and pounce on a moment when the market was down, and since that time, our stocks have returned 100, 200, or 300% return. I'm no genius on this, but everything was on sale and I had been saving and living this principle. Now I don't have six months supply, I have 12 months supply. And you're like, good for you. And I'm like, good for kingdom builders too, amen. Okay, wasn't genius, I was just being wise. 
I was doing what the Bible says. I was saving up. I was looking at the ant and realizing that it's not always good. There are bad days. And there are people that had bad days and they had nothing saved up and it buried them deeper. And if you look at what happened in 2020 with COVID, the, the haves got richer and the have-nots got poorer. It's a very sad thing. And we want our church to be people that say, we will save, we'll set aside the emergency fund, we'll set aside these living expenses. Now some would say, what's the difference between saving and hoarding? Saving is not presuming upon God and having some emergency fund, and you're not gonna presume upon God. Hoarding is when you say, I've replaced God and I no longer need him to provide. Saving, let me just illustrate this to you. Saving is when God speaks, you do it. And you're holding that money and God speaks and says, great return on the stock market. What about your kingdom builders pledge? Right? That's, and you go, yes, Lord. And you, and you give some money and you do that. Hoarding is God speaks to you and says, hey, let's talk about that account. And you go, la, 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 la. And you don't want to hear them. That's hoarding. And so God's okay with us saving. He's not okay with us hoarding. Now we need to be wise and we need to realize in this being wise, we need to live for eternity and not for here. Again, we can store up um, treasures in heaven and we need to realize that we're wise when we're actually living for heaven. And I love what Randy Alcor did and I think we, we have an illustration. He said, the dot on this illustration is your life on earth and the line is your life in eternity. And he said, you're foolish if you live for the dot and not the line. You're wise if you live for the line and not the dot. And that's the way I'm living. I'm living for the line and not the dot. And that's the way that I'm gonna live my life. I'm going to be wise. Now there's several things though that are things that we should be aware of. There's warnings. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth that's never satisfied with their income, this too is meaningless. Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Multimillionaire John D. Rockefeller was asked, how much is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And again, author Morgan Housel, he said this. He said, the hardest financial skill is getting the goalpost to stop moving. Because as soon as you get this, you see this, and then this, and then this. Jesus said it better than that, though. Jesus said, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And like I said earlier, it's so hard today. It's so much harder today. And I'll illustrate this to you. Years ago, now years ago, like years ago, my grandpa, okay? Think back, my grandpa age, all right? They had horses. He actually talked about, we had horses. We didn't have a car. Lived in North Dakota. He said, we had horses. And he talked about how fast his horses were. And his horses were faster than the other. Now they had horses and they had horses, but his horses were faster than the other people's horses. See, everybody had horses. And if you didn't have a horse, you had a donkey or a mule. All right, but it was similar, horse, horse. Faster horse, bigger horse, nicer horse, but a horse was a horse, of course. <laughs> then it moved to cars, all right? And then we measured horsepower with cars, and it was a car. And it might be your car was a Chevy and their car was a Cadillac, and they might've had AC power steering and power brakes. How many remember when those were an option on the car? Like, do you want air conditioning? Of course. It's $1,800, we'll roll the windows down, you know. I mean, power brake, fire steering, you're like, you know, trying to get that thing to turn. Some of you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I feel, uh, I feel like really old, like, ooh. when I grew up, we hid our money in the mattress, you know what I'm saying, like, that's how I feel. But it's true, I mean, so it was, it was, but it was same, same, car, 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 car. It was TV. Maybe you had black and white, they had color. I remember my mom and dad got color TV. Everybody in the neighborhood came over to see the color TV. We watched Wizard of Oz. My dad's like, is this thing broken? You know, because the first part starts out in black and white and then it goes to color. And he's sitting there, I paid all that money for this stupid TV. And then it went color. He's like, all right, there you go. Yeah. But TV, 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 you got it, right? You'd fly, they'd fly. First class, you'd walk by, I'm like, oh, he's getting a meal. I'm getting nothing. All right. But you're on the same plane. You might see a celebrity on the plane, right? Okay, now it's changed. Now it's not just a car, it's a McLaren for $2.5 million. It's not even in the same league. 
It's not just flying. It's not just flying first class. It's private jet. It's not just private jet. It's G5. They own the, they own the jet. They own the jet. It's not just they're going on a Florida vacation. They bought an island. Okay? Like true. Leonardo DiCaprio, Eddie Murphy, Tyler Perry, Mel Gibson, Larry Ellison, they all own islands. Okay, Larry Ellison, the co-founder of Oracle, he bought Lanai, like a 141 square mile island in Hawaii. He bought it. That's not like, it's a small world. That's like, I own Hawaii. (laughs) And so what happens is there's this new level of greed and envy and you need the wisdom in the Bible more than you've ever needed it before because all these things are on steroids. And, and, and that's why we teach the tithe. I believe contentment starts by honoring God and saying, you get the first bite, you're first in my life, and, and I'm, I'm gonna honor you. And then it grows from there, and you say, I'm gonna be generous, and I'm gonna be a kingdom builder, and I'm gonna do that. And, and, and you start fighting against this, this coveting chameleon, and that's what I would call it. Coveting is like a chameleon sin. It adapts for you and I. You say, well, I'm not jealous of an island. I can't ever afford an island, but let me show you how coveting is a chameleon sin and it attacks all of us differently. A child will see another child with a cookie and immediately start to covet. They'll see him with a toy. I've watched, I used to watch kids in the toddler church, you know, when I was in high school, you know, I took my turn volunteering in there and I watch them, they'd be holding the toy and somebody else would be playing with the toy, they'd drop that toy and they'd fight over that toy. You're like, there's a hundred toys. And they you gotta say, see, cause coveting is a chameleon sin. And then it hits the teenager and they say, oh, you got that new car? My mom and dad bought me a used car. Oh, you got that phone? I was talking to a, a guy that does security at one of the local high schools. He said, the biggest problem is theft. These kids have everything in the world, but they steal like crazy because they just, they covet, they covet, they have greed, it it, it attacks them. See, it's a chameleon. You're young married and all of a sudden it starts to hit you and you see that starter home. You're living in the apartment. They got a starter home. They got restoration hardware furniture. How in the world can they afford that, right? And then you're a mom. It's the purse or it's the pair of shoes. It's the dad, it's the watch or the stock move. Some of you are like, I didn't make 100%. All right, it happens like that. And it just, it's a chameleon and it attacks you. If you're a professional, it's a mansion, a boat or a vacation home. And if you're rich, you covet the islands. See, it's a chameleon. And it attacks us all differently. And so Jesus says we've got to be on guard against this. All forms of greed, all of this. And it hits you even when times are good and when times are bad. You can have the best year ever and you still want more. You can have the worst year ever and you want them to have less. And all of a sudden it attacks you. So we covet, we go into debt and we buy things to impress people. And the crazy thing is, when we have those things to impress other people, they're not impressed. You may spend $100,000 on a car, and you pull up to the stoplight, and everybody looks at you, wow, look at the car. Look at, you think they're saying, that guy's amazing. They look at you and go, he's a jerk. That car's amazing. <laughs> That's what they're thinking. And you're trying to impress them, and they think you're a jerk. But they like your car, Okay? You want respect, but you're only getting attention. And that's a poor substitute. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 1, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Now back to Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. All throughout the Bible, God dealt with rich, and poor, he dealt with kings and leaders and servants and slaves. And he didn't talk about their bank account. And they weren't like, oh God, could you give me more money? They were like, I want more of you. I want more of your presence. Moses, when he was going to the promised land, said, God, if you don't give us lots of gold, we can't do it. We're we're never gonna be able to afford living there. You know what he said? If your presence doesn't go with us, we don't wanna go. That's why I say, if I have you, if I have you, that's all I need. It's not about the stuff here, it's you. And if I have you, I have all I need. And that's something that all of us have to get to that point. If I have you, I have all I need. And whether you move me up, down, or over, I'll make the most of every situation you put me in and I'll give you praise, I'll give you glory, I'll give you honor, but I never wanna lose focus of you. 
That's why the writer of Proverbs says, don't give me too much so I forget you, and don't give me too little so that I, I make you look bad. Give me just enough, just enough, so I stay right in the sweet spot. I never need more than Jesus. God's my portion, he's my inheritance, he's all I need. When he says save, I save. When he says give, I give. When he says go, I go. And I just obey what he's doing, why? Because it's all about him. It's not about this stuff. I'm living for the line and not the dot. So what's your next step as we wrap this up? You need wisdom. I mean, I think I've built the case here that now more than ever, we need wisdom. We need God's word to speak into our life. Maybe your next step is Ramsey Plus. You're gonna sign up. Maybe your next step is tithing. You just gotta do it. You gotta do it. I know it. I've talked to so many people. They're so afraid. They're so afraid. They're so afraid. I'll never forget one person wrote at the tithe check and he says, now we don't eat this week. He told his wife, he said, finally, great, we'll do it. Throws it in. And he goes to work that next day. They said, hey, we wanted to give you a raise, 10%. He's like, you gotta be kidding. You know. <laughs> you just gotta be able to step out in faith and then you just survive. It's like, it's like a free fall. And while you're falling, you're just like, God, 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 please, please, please. And then all of a sudden he catches you. And, and, and all of a sudden you realize that the first blesses the rest. You gotta step out in faith and do that. Some of you, it's your kingdom builders over and above. I know people that are like, I'll do tithe and nothing more. Man, I wanna live blessed to be a blessing. I wanna ask God, how much can I give you? You've given me so much. How much can I give you? Some of you, that's what you, you need to really pray about what your part is in the 7.5 million. Many of us need to confess that we've been coveting. We're so used to coveting that we don't even confess it anymore. I read this in a book, I can't remember, but it said, capitalism is very good at creating wealth and creating envy. What we're living in, capitalism is amazing at creating wealth, but it also is amazing at creating envy, and the church should constantly be confessing that, God, we don't wanna live that. We, we have you, we have all we need. God, help us to be blessed, to be a blessing. How do we ever get to live where we live right now with so much in our hands? Help us to live blessed, to be a blessing. Some of us need to stop hoarding, and I really believe this. I have no one in mind, but I, God had me add this at the last minute. You gotta stop hoarding. Some of you are gonna be set free when, like Zacchaeus, you say, I I'll give half of what, I have, like to the poor, I, I, I'll give. Some of you have been hoarding. Some of you have so much and it, it, it's just locked up and you have like giving constipation and God's like, you need to stop hoarding. And I, I really believe this, you're gonna be set free. I really do. I believe you're gonna be set free because things have been holding you back and if, if you hoard, it's just gonna rot you. And all of us need to delight ourselves in God. I have you, Jesus, I have all I need. You'll never leave me nor forsake me. No matter where I am, up, down, over, leader, boss, slave, servant, wherever I am, you will never leave me. I delight myself in you, and I'm praying you'll take your next step in Jesus' name. Beware, be wise, and let's live blessed to be a blessing. Lord, I just pray right now. Now more than ever, I just pray that we would just realize we need your wisdom. So many of us have been doing it on our own. I come against the pride that says, I don't need to even learn what... Dave Ramsey has to say. I don't, even need to, I don't even need to know what the Bible has to say. I got it all figured out. It's gonna come through. I'm gonna make these moves. God, I come against the person that thinks they're a self-made man or a self-made woman. You give us the ability to earn wealth. God, I, I just pray for a great obedience. There's no condemnation. There's no condemnation. There's joy. It's not a, a burden to give. It's life. It is life to be able to give to the one that has given us eternal life. It doesn't win more salvation. We're already saved. But God, we're just looking for ways to please you. We're looking for ways to fuel your, your mission. We're looking for ways to live obedient to you. And God, I just pray this. You speak to each one of us differently. You illustrated that so well in last week's message with the panel. You speak to each one of us. Just help us to say yes to whatever you're speaking. Help us to take those next steps and to be obedient. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen.